Whitehall, one, two, one, two. This is Scotland Yard. For the first time in history, Scotland Yard opens its official files to bring you the authentic true stories of some of its most baffling cases. These are the true stories, the plain, unvarnished facts, just as they occurred, reenacted for you by an all-British cast. Only the names of the participants have, for obvious reasons, been changed. The stories are presented with the full cooperation of Scotland Yard. Research on Whitehall 1212 comes from Percy Hoskins, chief crime reporter of the London Daily Express. The stories for radio are written and directed by Willis Cooper. Here is Chief Superintendent John Davidson, custodian of the famous Black Museum of Scotland Yard. Good afternoon. This exhibit from the files of the Black Museum is labeled 50MR242, which is the file number of the case you are here about. You'll note that it is not a very good wedding ring. That is, it is of intrinsically poor quality. The base metal of which it was made shows through the shabby, worn covering of gold wash with which it was once adorned. Base metal. <laughs> it's as base as the purpose for which the ring was purchased for six shillings, as false as the promises of the bridegroom who bought it and took it back again after it had served its purpose. I hope you'll pardon my sentimentality. A policeman is generally not entitled to that luxury. I ask you to judge for yourself. Inspector Stephen Rockheed, who was Scotland Yard's principal representative in this case, shares my feelings, I think. Your feelings seem to have been shared by a great many persons who participated in this case, John. Witness Mr. Justice Brewster and what he didn't say at the trial. I'm afraid I don't remember, Stephen. He omitted the phrase, May the Lord have mercy on your soul when he sentenced Stanley Brown to death. Five O 242 began for me with what, if it happened in a drama for the wireless, would be described as an incredible coincidence. A letter had been passed to my desk. It had been addressed to Criminal Investigation Department, New Scotland Yard. A letter from a man named Crittenden, living at Aston Clinton in Buckinghamshire. The CID receives dozens of letters of its type daily, and it is our generally tiresome duty to read them all. Whilst I was glancing over it, a visitor was announced. Before he sat down, he laid a three-days-old copy of the morning telegraph on my desk. You're Inspector Rockheed? Yes. My name's Ramsey, Norman Ramsey, formerly of Blackpool, now resident in Shepherd's Bush. Yes. I've been carrying this paper around for three days. Why? This article here, sir. This one? Here. Highgate Tragedy. Bride drowns in bath. That's the one. What about it, Mr. Ramsey? Well, I've come here because I was a witness to a very similar case two years ago. Where, sir? In Blackpool, where I formerly lived. A bride drowned in her bath just two days after her wedding. What was her name? Brown. I see. Well, Mr. Ramsey, you are to be commended for bringing this to our attention. That was her husband's name, I assume. Stanley Brown was his name. What happened to him, do you remember? I don't know. He went away the day his wife was buried. In rather a hurry, I thought. Are you making an accusation, Mr. Ramsey? I must admit I didn't like the fellow. Are you making an accusation? I am telling you what I know about an extraordinary coincidence, sir. Excuse me. Did you know the wife's maiden name? Oh, I believe it was Crittenden. Crittenden? No, that's right, yes, I'm sure. Alicia Crittenden. Oh, you've heard of the case. Do you remember how the late Mrs. Stanley Brown, the former Alicia Crittenden, was buried, sir? I most certainly do. It's the most shocking thing I'd ever heard of. She was buried in a common grave... With three other deceased persons in the cheapest part of the graveyard. How do you know that? Because I have a letter here in this morning's post from her father relating the same facts you've just told me and considerably more besides. 
You speak of a coincidence, Mr. Oh, Ramsey. Why, well, this is amazing. It's more than that, sir. I'm afraid I shall have to ask you a few more questions. We talked for two hours. Mr. Ramsey remembered a great many things about the death of the bride and her bath at Blackpool. He remembered a representative of an insurance firm who had asked him his opinion of Alicia Crittenden Brown as a potential risk for life insurance. He recalled having been asked to witness two newly drawn wills, one of the husband and one of the wife, in which each left the other everything. He recalled the circumstances of the fatal bath. Well, they had two small rooms on the first floor in this house. It, it was a sort of private lodging house, you see. Extremely charming people owned it, Mr. and Mrs. Ralston. I've heard that they've gone to America. Well, I remember the circumstances quite well indeed. The bathroom was just above the kitchen where the rest of us were sitting this particular Saturday night. Do you remember exactly when it was? Early in March, if I remember correctly. She was upstairs. I, I, I remember his saying to her, Now, mind, don't get the bath too hot. Remember your seizures. Her what? Seizures. She had epilepsy, I believe. Well, then, it was very quiet on the floor above us, and at last Brown said he was a bit worried about her and went up. Came back almost at once and said, Oh, she's all right, or something like that. Sat down and played the piano for a while. Then he went upstairs again, and I heard him calling out that she had drowned. Mm. The doctor came, and that was the whole thing. And you have certain suspicions? Not enough to go to the police. Before, I mean. You obviously have now. Did you notice the name of the husband of the bride who was drowned in the bath at Highgate? Why, I... Look at the paper here. Stanley. J. Stanley. Stanley Brown's full name was James Stanley Brown. Well, Mr... I'm sure you understand, Inspector, that I realize I may be doing the man a dreadful injustice. He, he may, so far as I know, be the victim of... Well, Coincidence? Yeah. Well, yes, put it that way, if you like. I shall never forgive myself if I've stirred up suspicion of an innocent man, but... You'd also... recognize him if you saw him? Of course. Never forget him. Tall, heavy man with a long face like a horse, perfectly bald head and the most extraordinary eyes I've ever seen. Absolutely dead eyes. Like some primordial monster from the slime of an ancient sea. Are you a poet, Mr. Ramsey? <laughs> I'm sorry. He is rather fishy looking. Yes, of course I'd recognize J. Stanley Brown. Excuse me. Will you put me through to the police at Highgate, please? Right. Ring me when you get them. I should like to ask you to come up to Highgate with me. Could you come this afternoon? Oh, this afternoon? Well, let me see. This. Sorry. That's all. Inspector Rockheed speaking, Scotland Yard. Oh, yes. Hello, is that you, Richard? Oh, I wanted to talk to Chief Inspector Richard Yarbrough at Highgate. Right. Oh, there you are, Richard. Stephen Rockheed here. Oh, fine, thank you. How are you? The young woman who died in her bath, when was it? The day before yesterday? Right. Mrs. Stanley. I'd like to have a look at her husband, Richard. Where would I find him? I mean, does he live at... What? What's the matter, really? sir? Uh, sh can't hear you, old boy. Oh, when? What? Interesting. The same day she was buried, eh? Uh, what? Uh, shh. I'm very sorry. That's very interesting. How long have they been married? Says recently married in the paper here. Hmm, three days. It's Brown, I know it. Sorry, sir. Well, yes, I would rather like to talk with him. I think we'd better pass the word to have him picked up. Is he gone? If you please, Mr. Ramsey. I'm sorry, I'm just trying to... What's he look like? Half a tick, where's my pencil? All right, here. Now, go ahead. Tall, about 14 stone. Big chap, isn't he? What kind of extraordinary eyes? Oh, but that's him. Like an insane what? What? Finn and Hattie? You do turn a phrase, Richard. Excuse me, what are you saying? A bald-headed. Ask him if he's bald-headed. Yes, bald-headed chap, is he? Oh, curly black hair. Well, well, that's not him. It can't be. Will you please be quiet, Mr. Ramsey? Well, he, he was perfectly... Sorry, Richard. 
Yes, thanks. Uh, give our people here at the yard the fullest description you have, and thank you very much indeed. No, I'm not sure, but the circumstances of his wife's funeral do interest me. I'm very curious. Thank you. Is he gone, sir? He's gone, yes. And where do you suppose his bride is? Well, you said she was buried. She and... is buried. In a common grave with four other miscellaneous corpses. Just like the other bride of three days who died in her bath. <laughs> Mr. J. Stanley of Highgate, who bore certain resemblances to Mr. James Stanley Brown of Blackpool, was not to be found. The attending physician at Highgate, who had signed the death certificate for the drowned bride, told us that she had visited him the afternoon of the fatal bath. He had given her some powders for what she described as a migraine headache, which was sometimes, she said, so severe that she had fainted from the pain. The powders had not been unsealed when the body was found, although the husband had told him that his bride had complained of a nagging headache immediately before her bath. You certified her death, of course, as from natural causes, I asked the doctor. I did, sir. I was convinced at the time, and still am, that a, a, a sudden twinge of pain caused her to faint. She slipped down in the bath until her head was under water and she drowned before, a, before aid could reach her. She was naturally alone in the bathroom, sir. Do you recall anything that her husband said at the time, sir? Well, the man was all but prostrated. He kept repeating that if he'd only insisted she take some of the medicine I had given her, she'd still be alive. Would she have been? In effect, I so certified this fact that... A post-mortem might... Uh... I, 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 I saw no need there, nor do I now of a post-mortem. If I may mention an opinion, I think you're being needlessly officious, sir. I'm sorry, doctor. Reply by Mr. Francis Harrington, insurance broker of Highgate, to an inquiry by Inspector Rocky of Scotland Yard. Uh, no, I did not pay the amount of the insurance to Mr. J. Stanley. Uh, Mrs. Stanley was insured in the amount of £1,000 sterling. Yes. Yes, he called me early on the following Monday morning with a copy of the death certificate, but, you know, there are certain formalities, you know, with, with the home office, and I was unable to give him a check. Yes, he was very annoyed. No, I did not think it unusual. I, I found that people are quite unpredictable in matters relating to life insurance. Yes. Yes, he said he would be away for some time. He, he said he would notify me of his address and I could send the check there. He notified me today and I've already sent him the company's check for £1,000 sterling. Yes. I, I think I can give it to you, yes. It's 8 Rotherhive Crescent, South End. You're quite welcome, sir. An inquiry at 8 Rotherhive Crescent, South End, disclosed the fact that this was an accommodation address. Stanley had picked up his check, cancelled his arrangements for receiving mail, and gone away from there, leaving no forwarding address. I was having a plate of cold roast beef with John Davidson, the Black Museum man, he was a superintendent then. In the course of our meal, I told him the sequence of events. John finished his roast beef in silence. What do you think, John, I asked. A little too well done for me, I'm afraid. What? I like my roast beef rare. Wasn't that what you were talking about? You know quite well I wasn't, John. Say, so pass those pickles if you're not going to eat them, will you? Mm -hmm. Well... Excellent pickle. Why, if you're asking about the story of the brides and the bath, Stephen... I am. Well, I am forcefully reminded of a biblical quotation. The wicked flee when no man pursueth. That's Proverbs 28, first verse. We're pursuing this fellow. Yeah, but he doesn't know it. As far as he knows, no man is pursuing him. Yes, but he... And he's obviously fleeing. Therefore, he must be wicked. QED. On the face of things, these two deaths are coincidences, John. Well, it's quite possible. We don't even know it's the same man. Bald-headed men don't suddenly grow curly black hair. Well, sometimes they wear wigs. Yeah, I'd thought of that. Have to find him to prove it. Is there any more beer in that jug? Thank you. No. 
I don't think you're going about finding him in the right way, Stephen. Do you have any suggestion, then? Say, no more of that beer, I suppose. That's a pity. Why, I think if I were doing it, I'd take my cue from that proverb I just quoted. Well? I'd give the wicked something to flee from. He just might flee right into your arms. Perhaps you'll tell me how to do that one. Of course. Well, I'd dig up those girls' bodies and let Henry, Henry Burner, the pathologist, have a look at them. Hmm. Can't say I envy him. One of them's been dead a year or more, hasn't she? Two years. Poor Henry. Well, at least he could tell you whether the chap's really wicked or not. If he is, then cry havoc and let slip the dogs of war. And Julius Caesar, Act Three, Scene One. <laughs> After a series of annoying explanations on my part, I succeeded in obtaining the necessary permission to exhume the bodies of Alicia Crittenden Brown at Blackpool and of the late Mrs. J. Stanley at Highgate. Henry Bernard, the long-suffering pathologist, was assigned to perform the post-mortems on both bodies. Accordingly, he proceeded first to Blackpool in Lancashire for the first of the examinations. I waited impatiently. Two days later, I received a telephone call from that well-known watering place. It was, of course, Bernard. Henry Bernard, here, Rocky. Well, I'm finished. It's, of course, impossible to say at this late date whether the woman was really a sufferer from epilepsy. I told you that before I came up here. What? No, there's no evidence of any organic disease. No, she wasn't poisoned. No, there's no indication whatever of any wound of any kind on the body. Lacking any other evidence, I can assure you there is none. We must accept the fact that she drowned as a result of an epileptic seizure. No, there can be no more to add. I Excuse suppose. me, there's I am, the however, door. conferring this evening with the doctor who signed the death certificate. Excuse me, sir. Yes, you what do you want? I'm talking on the... the police station just telephoned you. They, they waited, but then they said they wouldn't wait any longer. And please to give you the message at once, as it is extremely important. Well, spit it out. What do they want? Uh, it was Inspector Wogan, sir. He, he said to tell you that there's a lady complaining to them that her husband is threatening to kill her. Now, look here, Constable. I'm in no mood to be bothered with details. It can be handled by... Tell them to do their own work. I'm busy. Of all the... Hello, Bernard. Hello, are you there? Hello. Oh, he's hung up, damn it. Now, look here. Well, they said you'd be most interested when you hear the lady's name, sir. Well, what is her name, then? Uh, Mrs. J. Stanley Brown, sir. I hurried at once to Wardour Street, where Mrs. Marigold Brown, the alleged wife of the vanishing J. Stanley Brown, had come to report the threat in her life. She was a tall, angular woman, singularly unattractive, wearing a shapeless grey tweed coat and a series of large aluminium bracelets which clanked. She sat stiffly in an uncomfortable chair and answered my questions quietly. Yes. We've been married for 11 years, Stanley and I. You could, of course, produce your marriage certificate, Mrs. Brown. I have it at home. Mr. Brown and you live together? He's away a great deal. I'm alone for several months at a time. Where does he go? His business takes him to various parts of the country. What is his business, Mrs. Brown? I'm afraid I don't know. Does he... He doesn't give me much money. When he's away, I generally go into service. I'm considered quite a good housemaid. Do you know what your husband does when he's away from home? I think he deals in second-hand goods in various places. Do you hear from him when he's away? He sends me picture postcards. From where, for example? Mm, Portsmouth, Bristol, various places. Blackpool. Where? Blackpool. That was a long time ago. Two years. He doesn't tell me his business. This is the first time he's threatened your life? I've been a good wife to him all these years. Would you answer my question, please, Mrs. Brown? Well, he said things in the heat of the moment. Not threatened me, but he said he wished... He was well rid of me. And this time? He meant it. I could tell from his face that he meant it. I could tell by the way he shouted. 
And he laid hands on me, too. Your eye? Yes. What was the occasion for this? I don't ask Stanley for money very often. But this time I knew he had some money. He'd been drinking when he came back from Highgate. Highgate, you say? Yes. When I asked him if I could let me... Let me have two pounds for a new dress and coat. <laughs> he flew into a rage. He'd been drinking, I said. And he flew at me and broke my glasses and threatened my life. <laughs> Just what did he say to you, Mrs. Brown? He said... He said he'd take me and drown me. <laughs> Police stations throughout England were advised that Scotland Yard wanted J. Stanley Brown, not merely for questioning, as we would have had to say before his poor shabby wife made her complaint. Now he was wanted for a violation of the Summary Justice Act of 1879, threatening a breach of the King's Peace, which is felony. The questioning would come later. Henry Bernard, the pathologist, had left Blackpool and gone to Highgate for the post-mortem on the second bride. I came to the mortuary at his request. This is my assistant, Miss Littlejohn, Inspector Rocky. How do you do, Miss nice Littlejohn? Nice to know you, sir. Thank you very much. I found out something, Inspector. Come over here, please. Dead bodies don't bother you, I hope. Oh, no. I've uh, brought the last Mrs. Uh, Stanley, he called himself at Highgate, didn't they? Stanley, yes. Mm-hmm. Well, there's nothing at all I could discover on the one at Blackpool. But this one is... Much more recent, you see. A little more than a week. Yes. Hmm, she must have been quite good-looking. Puzzles me why girls like this will marry such rascals. I understand he's hideous. So we hear. Well, what did you find to show me? Well, I'll get to it in a second. First, though, the bride at Blackpool. She didn't have any epilepsy. I thought you said you couldn't be sure. I can be sure of one thing. Look. I've had a bathtub brought in here. Where? Oh, there. Well, what's now, that? Now, be patient, be patient. This is exactly the same type of bathtub in which the woman at Blackpool was drowned. And by another of those coincidences you're so fond of, also the same as the one at Highgate. I've seen them both. Now, now I'm going to show you something. Miss Littlejohn. Yes, sir. Oh, I hope that water isn't cold. You've had it filled? Of course. Now, Miss Littlejohn, if you'll take off your clothes. <laughs> it's all right, Inspector. I've got a bathing suit under my smock. Oh, no, you didn't think... <laughs> uh, take off your shoes, Miss Littlejohn. Oh, yeah. All right. Now get in the tub. I feel most awfully silly. You'd feel sillier without your bathing suit. Get in, please. Yes, sir. Oh, oh I thought you said this was warm. Sit down. Oh. Now, the first reaction in an epileptic seizure is a sudden stiffening of the muscles, especially of the legs. Miss Little John will now stretch out her legs sharply, observe. If you please, Miss Little John. Uh huh. Well, nothing happened. Of course. An epileptic would merely prop herself against the foot of the tub, her back resting against the slanted end, and her head out of the water, like Miss Littlejohn. She's wedged in there. But if her legs were relaxed. Show him, Miss Littlejohn. Uh, now, I'll show you something else. Step around here to the end of the tub. Uh, 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 take off your coat. Doesn't matter if your shirt sleeves get wet. What are you going to do? You're going to do it. Reach down in the water. <laughs> no, no, no. Do be careful. Uh, take, hold, uh, take hold of Miss Little John's ankles. Well, I... Go on, go on. Excuse me, Miss Little John. <laughs> oh, no. No, no, no. Do be careful now. Uh, lift no. her feet out of the tub. Oh. 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 Hold her feet up. Hold them up. 
Yeah. Hold them up. Uh, but her uh, head uh, is underwater, man. Of course, old chap. She's drowning. That's the way the young lady over there on the table was murdered. Oh, I say, drop her feet. She is drowning. I would not recommend that you try that trick with a friend. It took artificial respiration to revive Miss Little John. And when Bernard showed me marks on the ankles of the drowned bride, marks that fingernails would have just fitted into, well, we measured the tiny scars and photographed them for comparison with the fingers of Stanley Brown. Should we ever catch him? It was almost exactly seven weeks later... I had a telephone call from Mrs. James Stanley Brown, the living one. Please come to my flat at once, she said. It's of the highest importance. I went there. Mrs. Brown was quite excited. I'm so glad you've come, Inspector. What's happened, Mrs. Brown? Oh, Inspector, I want to withdraw the charge against my husband. Please say I can withdraw it. Why, Mrs. Brown, I... Please say I may. Oh, please. I'm afraid I'll have to know more about this, Mrs. Brown, before I can answer Oh, that. it's quite simple. We've made up again. You and... what? Oh, and, and no, but, you know, we've decided it was so awfully silly for us to be quarreling, and he's promised. You've seen your husband? Yes, he came back to me. And we've had such a long talk. We're going to start over again, and... Whose idea was this? Why, is, of course. And now I want to cancel a silly charge I laid against it him. It wasn't a silly charge, Mrs. Brown. I'm so ashamed of myself. I simply must have you drop these charges. They're only a formality, anyhow. Oh, we're going to be so happy. Already he's begun to treat me just like a bride, Inspector. Where is he now, Mrs. Brown? The dear great boy. Where is he, please? <laughs> you won't believe it, but he's upstairs right this minute, preparing me an heavenly bomb. <laughs> just like a bride. She wept bitterly when I arrested him in the bathroom alongside the inviting full tub, stinking of cheap bath salts for this pathetic last bath. Despite the things he'd done to Marigold Brown, her dreams died hard, but they died when she heard the story of the other brides who had had their baths. Henry Bernard proved the points he'd made to me and Miss Little John. In the face of it all, Stanley Brown confessed... On that day, Marigold Brown stopped weeping and believing in this black-hearted man. He was found guilty, of course, and sentenced to death. He was guilty of the death of three women. On the day he was hanged at Wandsworth, Marigold Brown committed suicide. I think there's some good advice in what Superintendent John Davidson told me. Give the wicked something to flee from. Sometimes they'll flee right into your arms. You have heard another in the series Whitehall 1212. Research is from Percy Hoskins of the London Daily Express. Among those heard in today's story of Scotland Yard case number 50MR242 were Harvey Hayes, Winston Ross, Horace Braham, Lester Fletcher, Patricia Courtley, and Beulah Garrick. The stories for radio are written and directed by Willis Cooper. The fight against cancer is your fight. You're personally concerned with this disease, for anyone can develop it. And there is something you can do to protect yourself and your family. First, familiarize yourself with the facts about cancer. Interesting, easy-to-understand literature may be obtained from the local unit of your American Cancer Society. Guard your family and strike back against cancer. Mail a generous contribution to Cancer in care of your local post office. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company. Thank mm -hmm. you.